One of the most important concepts uh, in scripture is being violated uh, all the time these days, and we're going to go through it using David Bohm, a quantum physicist, some Hinduism, and Michelangelo. We're going to weave those all together to clarify a uh, very important Bible teaching, Matthew 7, 3, which is, do not worry about a speck in your neighbor's eye when you have a log in your own. Okay? We are in a culture now, all that uh, most people are doing, so it seems, is worrying about specks and logs in other people's eyes and acting as if they have none. And uh, all of us fall a victim of that one time or another. It's very hard to avoid being judgmental in that, in that way. But uh, we'll never get out of the, the mess that we're in if, uh, if we continue to violate that very important principle. Okay? So I'm going to start with a couple other quotes. Uh, none of them scripture, but they're all very valuable. Einstein said that imagination is more important than knowledge. Coming from a very smart guy to emphasize imagination, visualizing things, per perceiving things in a different way, is more important than the actual knowledge that might even get you there. David Bohm, the physicist that we're about to talk about, said this, the ability to perceive or to think differently is more important than the knowledge gained. Meaning, science largely, which is gaining knowledge, science largely is there for us to perceive things differently, right? To learn how to think differently. I'm a therapist. What I do with people is work on learning how to think differently and, most importantly, perceiving your life differently. If we keep seeing this world as the physical place that it is, and especially if we keep judging other people for the specks or logs in their eyes, we're never going to get out. Now, David Bohm wrote a very uh, interesting spiritual physics type book called Wholeness in the Implicate Order, in which he was bridging some of the gap between that which is the physical world and that which is the spiritual world. And of course, that's what we like to do here as well. So I'm going to go through uh, his, the concept of what he calls implicate order and, and talk about very specifically how it's important to not judge another person that way, but much more important to remove the logs and the specks from our own eyes first. Right? Why does Buddha say strive for your own liberation with diligence? Because I have a duty before I look at you and judge you and tell you what to do and this is how you should be. I have to figure something very important out. Now linked to that is this concept, hurt people hurt people. We've all heard that before. Billions of people have said it. I tried to see who said it first, but it's just logic. I know it's not in scripture, but it could be a very logical thing. Hurt people hurt people. It's one way to very quickly understand if someone's hurt you that they're hurting inside. And so when we're judging other people and calling them a bunch of names for being bad people, you can rest assured that they're hurting inside one, one way or another. Karma will take care of them. That's one reason why forgiveness is what we need to do next, not continue to lay more hurt upon people who are already hurting. Okay? So a corollary to hurt people hurt people is heal people heal people. Now, I thought I was the clever one that thought that up, but then I researched it on Google, and sure enough, 37 million hits on healed people, healed people, whatever. So <laughs> apparently it's pretty common, but it also makes sense. Course in Miracles says if you want to help someone, the only thing you can do is see the light in them, right? You have to see the spirit in each other, not all the darkness. That's super easy to see. And when you train yourself to see the light in someone else, you learn how to see that, plus you amplify the light inside yourself. That's one way we work on healing. In Matthew 7, 5, Jesus says, once you've removed the log from your own eye, you can then help your neighbor with their speck, okay? That's a process that is obviously an internal one that uh, feels very liberating in ways that you, your heart wouldn't hurt in that process. A lot of what I see in American politics in particular and a lot of the mental health issues we have, a lot of hearts are hurting. And when we have fear and shame and guilt and all those negative emotions, our hearts hurt. But we know when that's cleared up, you know when you're not judging someone else, you feel liberated by that. And then you can actually help be more helpful with people whenever you have a, a certain quality of what's the link between all of us? What's the implicate order David Bohm's talking about? And so I'm going to link that to this Hinduism teaching and the Michelangelo statue sculpture of David. Okay? So, implicate order is the inner world. It's a world of uh, very specific interconnection. It's what he calls wholeness. And he got a lot of that from the scientific, the quantum physics concept of entanglement, what Einstein called spooky action at a distance, in which he was able to, scientists were able to determine that somehow energy and particles are connected from long distances apart, and they're, and they're connected simultaneously, and instantaneously one can affect another. That's obviously on the level of energy, and it's something that's very difficult to see visually if we can at all. Physically is the explicate order. That's when we have a physical focus, okay? That's the world of the visible that we can see each other. 
That's also the world of labels. It's the world of tall and short and black and white and male and female, and variations in between, right? And sexual orientation, and big houses and little houses, and countries, and all over the place. All the physical differences. And those are, that's explicate order. It's actually explicate chaos, because that's the world where stuff goes haywire. Where we see all this physical stuff happening, and it's external, and there's a, it's an easy way to understand it, experience it, because we can all see it, feel it, taste it, and touch it, and all that stuff, okay? Well, the world of implicate order is unbroken wholeness, says David Baum. Now, there's an unbroken wholeness that is, that, that's connecting us all right now. Anybody that's watching this or you in this room here and any, even loved ones who have passed, there's still a connection there. So I'm going to draw that for you in a second. But the concept in Hinduism is what's known as CD. Now, CD is a uh, concept of perfection that is uh, linked to every single other religion has a teaching on this. In, in Buddhism, it's Dzogchen, which is the great perfection. It's a state of just beingness. It's a perception in which you see the world in a very specific way. And I assure you, that's an ego-free way. It's also a unifying way. That's Dzogchen. It's Isan. And it's a very important uh, concept for a Muslim, the idea of having no doubt about God and living as if God is in the room, because God is in the room. The Spirit's always with us. But because we can't see God, we think we can get away with something, right? Well, you can't fool Mother Nature. And Isan is perfection in Islam. Jesus, in Matthew 5.48, says, be perfect. Pretty simple there, straight, direct line, be perfect. He's not talking about physical perfection, because that's impossible to pull off. It's not about having a great head of hair, or flat abs, or a million dollars, or two million. What's the perfect amount of money anyways? Can you have a perfect house? How about a perfect physical relationship? No doubt, loving God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, that's perfection. And that's an inner world thing, where the implicate is found. In the Tao, verse 29, it says, you are a vessel of perfection, which is to say the Explicate, which is the physical self, and all the labels, is some sort of vessel to carry around the implicate, which is the inner. And that's available to all of us all the time. You either perceive your world on the explicate or on the implicate. Okay? And so here's this drawing. I have four different people. Stick figure people, right? Bigger, a little smaller, much smaller, very small. It doesn't matter race, creed, sexual orientation, political affiliation, favorite football team, on and on and on, how much money you have. If you have a body, that's explicate. And what you do with the body, explicate. Okay? That's external stuff. Those are the labels. But within these bodies, we have a link. The inner world, seeing the light in each other. The inner world, I drew here as this blue spot in your heart and in your head. Either Christ consciousness or the, the uh, Holy Spirit you could find in your heart. That CD, to find the perfection, the way they teach it in Hinduism, is to realize that you were born with it. You don't even have to do anything. It's already there. Wherever you go, you're already with God. Your perfection is present right now. Well, how do we get to that? Like an onion, you have to peel back the layers. If the layers of an onion are like our labels, then think of the things that we label ourselves with physically. We label ourselves boys and girls, and black and white, and tall and short, and sexual orientation, and religious affiliation, and socioeconomic status. And we are obsessed with those things. And that's what causes pain. Looking at those things and judging other people as better or worse because of those things is why we fight. But if you just saw the light, either through the consciousness capability of a person or the spirit inside their hearts, this little blue dot here, what we have is a constant connection at all times. Entanglement, you might say. Minds are joined, as it says in Course in Miracles. And our hearts are joined. That's the implicate order. You can't see it, but you can feel it. It's also the world of fairness. Because no matter what package the external comes in, or whatever happens to the external, the internal is always there to be applied. And that's the order of things. The external world seems so chaotic, but we have an internal organization that's always available to us. You only have to choose to see it that way. And then you have to practice it. This is where Michelangelo comes in. Now, this is the hardest I've ever drawn to do a drawing, okay? Now, this is a marble block. This is obviously a hammer and a chisel, right? Okay. So I want you to think of this block as a block of fear or as block of our labels or the block of your temporary identity. 
okay? And hidden inside that block is something very special and unique. In order to get to what's inside, what we have to do is take that hammer and chisel and start chipping away at it. And if you can imagine Michelangelo carving out David with a hammer and a chisel, I'm sure that took him a really long time. It's a long journey to get that done, no doubt. Well, all of us are doing that. The great perfection is already in you. It can't be chased down. It has to be realized. That's why grace is given to us freely. There's nothing we can do to impress any type of physical God that's going to send us to hell if we do something wrong. What we have to do is realize that the little piece of God or the Holy Spirit is already inside of you. And again, every religion talks about that one way or another. And whatever words they use doesn't matter. It's that the Spirit is inside each one of us. Pay attention to the labels, you're going to get distracted. Obsess about your labels, right? Over attend to your labels. I'm a father, but that, I'm a temporary father. In a hundred years, I'm not going to be in the form that I am with my physical kids, and I won't be calling them my physical kids anymore, because we won't have these bodies. So I'm temporarily a father. I'm temporarily Steve. In a hundred years, I don't think people will be calling me Steve wherever I'm at. Right? I also once had hair, temporarily, and now I don't. I've detached from that, okay? So we have to detach, whether it's a physical thing like hair, a label like a dad, right? Or even a, an identity that's uh, seemingly so important, like our political affiliation and our religion. We have to learn how to release all of that. That's very well visualized by chipping away at a marble statue, okay? If I'm chipping at the marble block to get to the statue, what does it look like after a while? So here I have David, and if you recognize David, you can see how well I've drawn this, okay? See this arm right here? David's like this, <laughs> okay? That's the hardest I've ever worked on, on a stick figure. So here I've got David chiseled halfway out, okay? And here I have a bunch of um, debris, you know? These are marble chips, if you will. Some bigger ones, some littler ones, okay? There's dust all over the place. Chisel, chisel, chisel. I probably could have left a few specks in his eye, okay? The fact is, he's not done yet. In my great work, just as it is your great work, my great work is to free the inner David, okay? To free the perfection from inside oneself. The best way to think of that is to, low, uh, to lower our addiction to labels, right? To learn how to appreciate and respect other people's labels, even if you completely disagree, you must love your enemy. That's how you get rid of the, the, the marble pieces. That's how you start to chisel. And then we must break free of resentment and shame and impatience, fear and doubt and all of that. All of that is what the marble block is. It's a block of fear. Well, hidden inside that block of fear is the light. If you can think of this light inside your heart and your head, you can't see it, but you can feel it and you can sense that it's there. So we have to keep chiseling and chiseling, right? You get to a point where, well, you're half done, but now I should start telling other people what to do and how to be. Hmm. You have to go all the way to the end. Remember, Jesus says, don't worry about a speck in your neighbor's eye. I don't care if they've got a teeny tiny little problem that you disagree with. You still got a log in your own, he's saying. Right? He's emphasizing much more important for you to refine yourself than to tell other people what to do. Figure yourself out. With these characters here that I drew, I gave them all a different math equation, okay? I gave this guy 1 plus 1. I gave this gal square root of 49. I gave this person the derivative of x squared. And I gave this person 1 divided by 0. Now, they all have a different equation. If this person says the answer to their, this equation is 7, they're figuring out this person's equation, okay? What is the derivative of x squared? It's a tough one, right? <laughs> okay. It's the, only in, it's the only calculus I remember. It's 2x. I might have even got that wrong. Okay. So if this person says the answer to 1 over 0 is 2x, they'd be doing this person's math. And if all of them complain that this one has an easier equation, they're not chiseling a thing. They're trying to figure out somebody else's equation. Maybe it's easier, maybe it isn't. You don't have enough context to know. And if I'm supposed to be chiseling David, and I look over and someone's chiseling Spongebob, and I want to go work on that one or something, um, I'm going to fail my, my test, right? My question was given to me to figure out. I figure out my stuff, you figure out yours. Now, can we work on that together? Yes, absolutely, that's what we should be doing. In the spirit of, you know, collective chiseling, if you will, let's work on this together. Let's work on dropping labels together. Let's do so in a spirit of compassion and understanding and forgiveness. 
Again, scour the Bible for apologies, where Jesus demands apologies from other people. He doesn't. Uh, demanding an apology is like walking over to somebody else and saying, you, keep, you should keep chiseling, right? And resentment, especially if you get to a point in your development, is like picking up a, a, a block that you already knocked off yourself and gluing it back on, right? Why would we try to put this block of fear back together again? We're supposed to go all the way to the end, okay? We're supposed to go to the perfection, whether it's Zogchen or Esau or Jesus in Matthew 5, 48, or the Tao, Tao verse 29, or Sidi. The perfection is being revealed. It's a unique experience that all of us have the opportunity to do, but none of us are going to do it by telling someone else what they need to do, okay? What we do is have this experience an individual experience that we can do together as a community and we can make suggestions to each other. No one has to do it this way. This is me reinforcing the way I see the world. And I'm projecting that out there. Then I'll go read other people's uh, teachings on this and they'll suggest this and you'll suggest stuff back to me. And people will comment on a YouTube uh, page and, and uh, everybody, we're gonna listen to each other's feedback, right? Is this working for you? Is that working for you? Well, when people get to the experience of things like uh, Zog Chen, they say the same thing. I feel so liberated. In Hinduism, it's called moksha, which is liberation. And guess what it's liberation from? The ego and all our labels. Okay? So if you keep chiseling and chiseling and chiseling, you get to the point where now David is revealed. Okay? David was always hiding inside this marble block, wasn't he? And Michelangelo had a vision. And so he started chiseling. I can only imagine how much he was fine-tuning at the very end, too, right? A little bit of flex of little marble that he wanted to get off to make it perfect. That's the game we're playing, too. It's not good enough to get a 98% A. Perfection is 100% A. And Jesus said to be perfect like God is perfect. That's a high bar. Kabbalah calls it equivalence of form. You are going to keep chiseling until you reach God consciousness. And what is that? It's not as hard as we think. It means to be forgiving of everybody. It means to be loving of everybody, not just people that agree with you politically. It means to be patient all the time, right? It means to be wise and understand these things, okay? It, that's perfection. Animals do it quite gracefully, right? If we could be more like nature, it just flows like it needs to. We, however, resist and resent and fear and shame and all that kind of stuff. And that's the stuff that we have to chisel away. When you're done and reach the end and you've chiseled it all away, voila, there you are. That's what voila actually means. There it is. There you are. And what have you done? You've revealed the perfection that's currently inside you right now. And I linked it. See, there's the soul blob. That little dot, guess what? That's this thing that's currently inside each one of us at this exact moment. So the science of this, like Bohm would say, is just helping us understand how to look at the world different to shift our perceptions, to perceive the world differently. Don't open your eyes in the morning and see a physical world. Open your eyes and see a spiritual world. Don't see cars lined up uh, in, the, in front of you on the street and see uh, traffic and, and cuss it out. No, see a chance to be patient. And if someone hurts you, don't resent them and cuss them out. Opportunity for forgiveness, right? But at the same time, if people are doing bad things, I'm doing this very aggressively, uh, perhaps breaking the law. Can we pursue justice physically? Sure. But can you do so while you're loving a person? Yes. Okay? This is not, you know, Buddha gets criticized sometimes for his detachment. This is not not caring about the physical world. The truth is, city in Hinduism, they say you get magical qualities when you reach this point. It's also the Midas touch, when everything you touch turns to gold. At that point, magical qualities, things just turn out better. It just works better for you. Your golf game improves. Your relationships get better. Why? Because you've revealed the Holy Spirit inside yourself. Now, Jesus did this, clearly. He broke down all his barriers, all his labels. He said you must be born again. That means stop identifying as a physical being. Recognize your spiritual being. When you're born again, what are you able to do? Well, he was able to forgive people that were really hurting him, right? Didn't even see them as hurting him. He saw them as ignorant, and he was being loving, right? That's the way to be. That if people are hurting people, they're just ignorant. That just means they don't know. And to love them is to heal them. 
that's the energy, that's the quality we need to be putting out there, at least if we're going to say we're spiritual, right? So at the end, once it's revealed inside yourself, once you have the experience yourself, like Ram Dass says, if you haven't had the experience, no explanation is possible. If you've had the experience, no explanation is necessary. It's just a feeling, a state that you have, very blissful. It's really good mental health, right? We drop all our issues, we drop all our judgments, we can be very comfortable knowing that we're all on the same team. It's unbroken wholeness because everyone in the world has this option. Everyone's actually working on it one way or another, some more slowly than others. But the more you stay focused, the more you, you, you get into the idea and visualize. When Michelangelo visualized David, he got to work and he wasn't satisfied until David appeared before his eyes. Once you know you're a spiritual being, you're going to get to work. Chisel, chisel, chisel. You won't be satisfied until you've established all the virtues. The fact is, once you know what you need to do, you've got to get to work and pull off the job.